Today we are taking a look at one of my new favorite cameras, the Sony a7C Mark II. This camera has a ton of features and today we are covering it all so that you can have a deeper understanding of how to leverage it to your advantage and create awesome content. This is going to be a fairly longer video because there is a lot to cover, but for your convenience, I've gone ahead and placed different chapter markers on the bottom of the screen so that you can kind of scroll through and find exactly what it is that you're looking for. To kick things off, let's talk about the form factor of this camera. On the bottom, we have the battery door. So this is where you will place in your battery. Right over here on the grip, we have the on off switch. You can go ahead and turn your camera on. This dial is how you're going to be able to change modes to access different features of the camera. Right underneath the mode dial is what I'm calling a hybrid switch. There's photo, video, and s and &Q. When you're in photography, all of the menu settings will be geared for photography. When you're in video mode, they'll change a little bit for video and so on for s and &Q. Looking around, we have a couple of custom buttons. We have this red record button, which you can assign to other things. We have a C1 button, the menu button. We have an AF on button, which is also customizable. We have the function button, which brings up a function menu. We have the control wheel, which has different customizable buttons as well. And then we have a custom two button down here and we have a playback button. The camera has a multi-interface shoe with some options in the menu as well. And then on the bottom, there is a quarter inch screw thread for attaching different tripod plates. All right, let's get into the menu. First, we're gonna go over the video settings. So make sure this hybrid mode switch is set to video and then simply press menu. Let's get acquainted with the overall layout of the menu. Right over here on the sides, we have different icons. These each represent a different category for our menu. We have my menu, main, shooting, exposure slash color, focus, playback, network, and setup. This first setting, my menu, is pretty cool because you'll be able to add in different parts of the menu to a quick little list that you can easily access. So as we go through the menu today, just know that you'll be able to take really any of those items and place them in your own my menu. And you can have multiple my menus. To do this, all you'll need to do is go to my menu setting, hit add item, and then just scroll around till you find something that you wanna add. And then you can choose which My Menu to add it to, and you can choose where in the lineup you want it to be. Then it's added. Then you can simply hit Menu to exit out of that. And when you go to your My Menu, you'll now see that newly added item. If you wanna change the location of that, you can go to My Menu and choose Sort Item then you'll be able to select it and choose where you want it to go. And then you can hit menu, to exit out, and you'll see the order has changed. You can also choose to delete the item. So you can choose this item, delete it. This isn't deleting it from the master menu, it's just deleting it from this custom menu that you're creating. So that's basically how my menu works. Just below this is called main. What this is, is basically a quick glance at your camera's settings as they are currently. You can change some things here, but really it's just a nice way to kind of access stuff or see it at a quick glance. We'll also be able to change these things in other ways, utilizing the camera controls or in other menu settings. So we'll continue on to the red video icon, which is our shooting menu. If yours looks different than this, just make sure that your photo video hybrid switch is set to video and not photo or s and All right, first up in video is our image quality slash record. And within this, we have file format. This is where you'll be able to change your video resolution. Now, I'm not gonna be doing deep dives on every single menu item and explaining like what resolution is or you know, what ISO or white balance, shutter speed, aperture, any of that stuff is. So if you're unsure of some of those things and you wanna dive a little deeper, I have created a free course at supersimplecamerasettings.com. This is designed to teach you the fundamentals so that you don't have to be subject to what your camera is doing in auto modes, but you can actually choose when and where to take control of the camera and execute your vision. It will help you go from auto to manual in minutes. It's completely free and you can check it out at supersimplecamerasettings.com. So in this file format section, we have HD and 4K. 
I would definitely recommend changing it to 4K because it's going to give you a lot more resolution and quality in your video files. But the confusing thing about this is we have multiple 4K options. XAVC, HS, S, and SI. What do these mean? Well, they're basically different forms of compression. HS is going to be the most compressed file. It's going to be a lot smaller, uh, so it will take up less space on your SD cards and on your hard drives but it may be a little bit harder for your system to edit with unless you have a newer M1 style computer. S is going to be more of that middle ground, sort of a standard where you're going to get, you know, a little bit of compression, but it's not gonna to be too hard to edit with. You know, the file sizes will still be a little bit big, but you can still work with it pretty easily. And then you have SI. This is going to be the largest of the file sizes. It will take up a ton of space, but it should be a little bit easier for different computers to edit with it, even if you have an older computer, because it's basically not compressed at all. Again, we have HS, S, and SI. Now, what I'm about to say is not at all technically correct. It's just the way that I remember the settings. I view it as HS is, you know, high storage. You know, you get... It doesn't take up very much storage at all. S is standard, it's more middle of the road. And SI is um, stupidly, incredibly big files. <laughs> so that's kind of how I remember this when I'm looking at it. But I would recommend if you have an Apple M1 style computer or just a faster computer in general, I would use HS because it's just gonna save you on space. If you have an Intel Mac or an older computer, then I would recommend S. For me personally, I use HS. Now, just below file format, we have movie settings. This is where we're going to be able to change your frame rate. Your frame rate options will change depending on what you've selected in your file format. When you're in HS 4K, you can choose between 60 and 24. So if you really do wanna have like 30 frames a second, then you can go to, you know, S4K and you'll be able to access 30. Or if you wanna get even higher frame rates, you can choose HD and go back into here and you'll be able to go up to 120. But for now, I'm gonna go ahead and set it to HS4K and I'll change my record frame rate to 24. And then there's this record setting option. Here you have quite a bit of options as well. You have 30 megabytes, 420, 50, 50, 100, and 100, 422, 10-bit. So I'm just gonna do a real quick layout of what 8-bit and 10-bit and 420 and 422 is. I'm gonna try to simplify it as fast and as easy as I can. Let's start with bit rate. 10-bit is going to be the one you'll want to choose. It's going to be a ton more color information and just better quality files. In 8-bit, you're basically getting about 16 million colors. In 10-bit, you're getting like over a billion colors, which is just going to make your footage look a lot richer and better. So I would definitely choose 10-bit. Now, within 10-bit, you have all these options, 420 and 422. The difference between like 420 and 422, to my knowledge, is basically the distinguishable differences between individual colors. So in 420, you may have like red and different shades of red will kind of like not vary as much as they will in 422. You're gonna have a lot more information per pixel. So personally, I would choose 422 10-bit and I think that will give you the best quality results and overall a lot of great colors in your footage. Underneath movie settings, we have SNQ. SNQ stands for slow and quick and this is where you can utilize some slow motion or some time-lapse options. So when we go into the SNQ frame rate settings, this first one, record frame rate, is going to be what your final output will be. Think of like what you're making your video project timeline when you go to edit. A lot of times for me, I'll do 24. And then this second option is going to be what actual frame rate you're capturing in. So 60 FPS, as it says down here, will be giving you 2.5 slow motion. Now, if I change this to 30, it will be 1.25 slow motion. And I can take this all the way down to one, which is actually giving me 24 times quick motion, which would be a time lapse. So at the 24 frame timeline, I have these different options, 
So if you want to, you know, access slow motion, do 60. If you want to go more of a time lapse, you can choose one. For now, I'll set this to 60. And just like before, we have some record setting options for our S and Q. Again, I would choose 422 10-bit. Now, underneath this is a time-lapse setting, which is actually still for S and Q. This is a newer option, and it's a little bit different than your normal S and Q. When you choose to do this, it's a very similar setup. You have some different interval times that you can choose from for the time-lapse, and it's essentially going to create a video time-lapse for you within the camera. It's pretty cool. I like using the layout of it better when I'm shooting with it because it, it kind of tells me how long the video is going to be, uh, which is pretty sweet. So again, you can come in here and choose, I would recommend 422 10-bit again. Um, and then there's this video light option. I'm just gonna leave that off. But yeah, that's pretty much the time-lapse settings. It's another S and Q feature, and that's how you do it. Next up is log shooting setting. This is where things will get a little interesting. So when you shoot normally straight out of the bat with this camera, it's going to be in a standard picture profile. This is where you can come in here and choose that you want to shoot in a log profile. And you can actually choose things like the color gamut as well as you know embedding a LUT, which we'll get to in just a little bit. For now, I'm going to leave log shooting on so that when we get to this in the menu later, we can cover it. Underneath this is proxy settings, which I don't really mess with. But if you have an older computer or it's a little slower, you'll definitely want to utilize these. You can turn proxy recording on. You can set, you know, what your file formats are going to be and all of that good stuff. So it looks like within this, we'll need to have HS selected and we can choose, you know, what we want our proxy settings to be, and it will give you some information down here. Again, most of the time for me personally, I leave this off. I love the smaller file sizes with the HS setting that we've already selected previously. Next up is APS-C 35 shooting. This will allow your camera to go into crop sensor mode. So if you are using a crop sensor lens with this camera, it will automatically adjust your settings so that there's no bad vignettes going on. But you can also choose to manually do this even with a full frame lens to get some extra reach out of it. When doing this in photo mode, you will lose out on some megapixels, but when doing it in video mode, you lose no resolution at all, which is pretty cool. I use it all the time with my prime lenses to essentially get like two looks out of the lens. I would just recommend leaving this on auto. Just beneath this, we have lens compression. The only setting I really like to mess with in here is breathing compensation. This is pretty cool if you turn this on. It will crop into your image a little bit, but you know, with certain lenses, as you move the focus throughout the focus plane, it will breathe. It will sort of like warp in and out a little bit. But when you turn breathing compensation on and you use it with a Sony native lens, it will crop in a little bit, but that warpiness will be basically gone and it will just create a very smooth rack focusing effect. By default, I would leave this off, but I want you to know that it exists because in certain situations, personally, I will turn it on and find it very useful. Just under this is the media section where we can choose to format the SD card. You can also do some recovery or choose to display media info. Underneath media is file. This is where you can choose to write a serial number or you can go deeper into your file settings. And this is pretty sweet. So this is basically going to be selecting and changing the actual file names that you'll see on the SD card. So when you plug in your camera or you plug in the SD card and you're looking through your footage, this is where you can customize the way you want it to be labeled. A couple of the file name formats you can choose are standard, title, date and title, or title and date. In title name is where you can really get custom with it. So I'll go ahead and delete this. I guess I'll need to move it over, then delete, yep. This little arrow will allow us to do capital, and let's just do A, we'll come over to the number, seven, come back to the C, we'll make it a capital again, C, and let's do a, let's do an M, and go back to a number again, and we'll do a two. And then let's go to our little symbols. Let's go right over here and we'll do a little underscore and hit okay. 
So now our file names will be A7C Mark II with a little underscore. We'll hit OK. So now that we've entered in the title name, let's change the file name format to title. And now down at the bottom, you'll see A7C Mark II underscore and you'll see numbers. If at any point you wanna reset these numbers, you can go to series counter reset. Underneath file, we have shooting mode. So this is where we have the exposure control type, which is basically just showing us what our mode dial options are. And then we have camera set memory. So this is going to be a section that we will cover towards the end of this video. For now, we're going to move past it, but we will be coming back to it. Underneath shooting mode, we have shutter slash silent. This is going to give us some noise options. So if we go into the silent mode settings, we can choose to turn this on. When the camera is in silent mode, it won't be making any beeps or anything like that. In this section, you also have anti-flicker set. So if you're in an environment where there's a lot of like inconsistent lighting that's creating some scan lines or flickering going on, you can mess with the anti-flicker settings and try to dial it in to help compete with that and make the shot look more natural. Next is audio recording. So in here is where we'll be able to mess with some sound options. So we can choose if we want audio recording or not. We can choose what the level is. By default, it's usually 26. Um, I find it's usually good to leave it around there if you're not running anything into it. But if you are, then I would definitely recommend turning it down and just trying to get your levels a little bit above negative 12. Then underneath here, there's this wind noise reduction. Personally, I would turn this off. I think that it sounds pretty bad when wind noise kicks in. It just makes everything sound super tinny and really thin. And I would rather have the control to do that myself later. Underneath this is the multi-interface shoe settings. Depending on what sort of microphone you have plugged into this camera, it will give you access to some of the controls like four channel recording and things like that. I don't currently have something like that to plug in, so I'm not going to be able to show you that, but it's pretty straightforward. Next up is the TCUB options. This is all about time code. I'm gonna skip this menu setting because it's not something I've ever used or really intend on using anytime soon, but it's essentially just helping you line up time codes across multiple cameras and things for certain types of shoots. But I'm gonna go ahead and skip it. Next up is image stabilization. This is where we can choose what type of stabilization that we wanna use. There's off, standard, and active. Active will crop in just a little bit, but will create a lot better results. Um, I would pretty much choose to just leave this on auto, but if you really wanna get specific, like for example, I have a 20 millimeter lens on, you could manually choose the focal length of your lens to help specifically tell the camera what you're looking for. But I find it does a good job by default if you just leave it on auto. Next up is zoom, and this is where you have some different options where you can choose to use the optical zoom only, which is just going to be the focal length of your lens. You can choose to use clear image zoom, which will help you zoom in a little bit past that using some fun Sony digital magic, or you can do digital zoom, which is basically just kind of scaling it within the camera. Personally, I would stay away from digital zoom. I don't think it works very well. Um, optical zoom is fine if you wanna just do that, but I think clear image zoom is a decent option with these high quality 10 bit cameras. I think it does pretty good with it and it can basically make my 20 millimeter get a lot more reach out of it. It's really good if you're using a prime and you wanna get a little bit of extra reach, um, but this is where you can choose uh, to turn that on. Underneath this is where you can choose the zoom speed and underneath that is, again, you can choose the zoom speed when using remote. Next up, we have shooting display. When you turn on the grid line display, you'll be able to see a, you know, a nice little grid over top of your screen, and you can choose which type of grid that you wanna do. Personally, I like the rule of thirds grid. I think it's really helpful for composing my shots, and it doesn't take up too much of the screen, or I don't find it too distracting. And then underneath this is the emphasize record display. When you turn this on, you'll see a nice little red border that pops up around the screen to just to help visually communicate that the camera is recording. I like to leave this on. Next up are all about marker displays, and this is just going to help you have some frame of references while you're shooting different like center markers and safety guides and things like this. So I pretty much leave all of these off because I prefer just using rule of thirds, but feel free to dive in these settings and customize them to your liking. And the last page for our shooting menu is shooting option. <laughs> 
clever. Uh, so within this, we have a self timer option, which I guess is gonna be handy for certain types of vlogging or solo creating if you're not wanting to edit later, I guess. You can hit start, it will wait a few seconds and then start recording. Uh, personally, I just leave this off, but you can you know, customize how much of a delay it has, which is cool. Uh, but yeah, I pretty much just leave this off. And then under here is where you'll be able to see auto framing settings. This is Sony's new AI auto framing feature. To access this, you can turn it on, and then you have a few customizable options. I find that the medium crop level is pretty good. Um, again, this is all gonna be situational. Um, you have some different things like auto start, or you can choose to uh, start when tracking, which is pretty cool. Um, and then you can do uh, the tracking speed of which it follows you at, which is nice. Um, depending on what sort of you know workflow you've got going, you can choose to record your video files with this crop applied, but if you were running to a different HDMI recorder, you could choose to change this to do not crop, depending on all of your other settings. All right, we've made it through the shooting menu. Next up is exposure slash color. The first item here is exposure. I would go ahead and leave auto slow shutter on. Here's where you can change your ISO. There's other places to do this on the camera as well. And then this is where you can set an ISO range limit, which is nice if you know there's a certain ISO that you never really wanna go past, you know, like 12,800. You could change this here and save it. And then when you go to actually adjust your ISO, the max setting will be that 12,800. Now the camera does go higher than that, as you guys can see. I'll take it all the way up to the max. And now when I go back to the ISO, I'll be able to take it really far up. So you've got those options. You can play with it, see what you like, what you don't like, and set your limits there. Underneath this, we have exposure comp, and I would just basically leave this where it is. Then we've got metering. I would go ahead and choose multi, and then face priority, I would choose on, and spot metering is fine with center. I like using face priority, especially for vlogging and things like that. It's just gonna help keep the exposure based around your face and not the overall image. So I find it's more important for my face to pr be prioritized in those situations. If you don't like that, you can certainly just turn this off, but personally, I like to leave it on. Underneath this, we have white balance. This is where we can kind of choose how we wanna prioritize the white balance. Do we want our whites to really just look white always, which would be this auto white balance white setting, or we can do ambient. So if we want certain things in the frame to look more natural as they are, if there's a lot of warm lights or stuff like that, or there's just standard. Personally, I leave it on standard. And then shockless white balance is just gonna be like how fast your white balance is going to be adjusting in camera. I just leave this on one. Um, I do like it to be changing, you know, to be getting it right most of the time. Now let's talk about, you know, some of these color slash tone options. So if you see these grayed out, it's probably because your log shooting is on and you'll just need to turn it off. So within the uh, color slash tone, we have this dynamic range optimizer. I like to leave this on. Uh, creative look, I like to leave as standard, but you can certainly go through and try some different things. Neutral can be good sometimes, but personally, I like the punchiness of standard. And then this is where we can choose different picture profiles. I really like the way this camera looks when the picture profiles are off, but you can also use things like S Cinetone, or you can utilize Cine2 or S Log3. Those are all great options. They can just require a little bit more work in post-production. Um, and personally, I think the color science in this camera with the 10-bit color and 422 and all that stuff is so good that, you know, the standard mode looks very nice and it gives me a great place to start if I want to stylize it a little bit with a color grade. Again, this is all depending on what your workflow is. If I was shooting a very, you know, super pro job, then I would probably choose to do S-Log3 just so I have the full dynamic control later on. But for social media and quicker turnaround times, you know, shooting standard, you know, basic settings, it still looks really good. And then down at the bottom, we have soft skin effect. I would leave this off. I think it looks pretty bad no matter what it's set to, but you've got the option if you want it. Um, then we have this manage user LUTs section. Let's go ahead and hop back to our shooting menu and go to our log shooting setting and turn this on for a moment. And then we'll go back into our 
color slash tone menu. And this is where things get interesting. So this camera is pretty cool because you can choose to shoot in something like S-Log3, where you have a very flat grayed out image, which gives you the most amount of dynamic range and customization later on. But the cool thing about this is you can actually import and use LUTs either as a reference or embedded directly into the footage. And this is where you get to choose it. So if you go to manage user LUTs and choose import, this is where you'll be able to import different LUTs. To import the LUTs, you'll need to plug in your SD card into your computer and go and create a file on that SD card called LUTs. Then you'll need to go and drag LUT files from your computer into this folder. And then when you place the SD card back into the camera, you'll be able to access all of these LUTs. And this is where you do it. You go to manage user LUTs, import slash edit. You can select a user and you'll be able to see different LUTs that you have loaded onto your SD card. And you can choose where you want these to be imported. You can also go to delete and you'll be able to delete the LUTs. Under select LUT, you'll be able to go through and see what these LUTs look like, uh, which is really nice because if you know you're going to use a certain LUT in your project, maybe you just have a certain style or, or you know tones that you like, you can see what that's going to look like in real time and it will help you expose it better because you know what it's going to look like in the end, which is just awesome. And then, like I mentioned earlier, you can come back to the shooting menu and go down to log shooting setting, and then you can choose to embed the LUT file. If you turn this on, then you're not gonna get your super dynamic grayed out looking shot in log, even if you're shooting in log. You're going to get it with the LUT already applied. Most of the time, I would not recommend doing this unless you're just trying to do a really fast turnaround, but I do think it's cool that you have the option for it. Going back to color and tone, uh, the next setting is zebra display. This is just gonna help you with your exposure. You can choose to turn this on or off. It will show some lines in the blown out areas and you can choose where you want these to kick in. Next up, we have the focus menu. The first item here is AFMF, autofocus, manual focus. This is where you can change the transition speed of how fast or slow the focus will go, as well as the, the shift sensitivity, which is going to be if you're focused on a subject and something comes into the frame, how long will it take before it decides to move to that new object? So if things are passing by quick, it will stay locked on your subject. But if you make this a lot faster and things are moving within frame, it will go hunt for them right away. So you've got some you know, different tools there. Next, we have the focus area. This is you know your typical wide spot, expanded spot, all of those good things. Within the focus area limit, you can actually deselect some of these options if you just don't wanna to have to cycle through them which is pretty cool. Uh, you can choose if you want your focus area to be white or red. You can also adjust how much the autofocus frame moves, which is nice. Next up is subject recognition. This is going to give you a ton of information for your autofocusing options. Um, by default, I would definitely just leave this on because it's going to you know, choose to recognize different targets. Um, and this is where you can select which targets you want to choose. If you want to do human, animal, bird, insect, cars, airplanes. For starters, I'd leave it on human unless you know you're going to be shooting something else. Um, this is where you can select, you know, how many of these things you want to be able to cycle through in the menu, which is nice. So, you know, it's a little redundant to have animal and bird or animal bird. So let's just do unchecking those options for now. Uh, then we can choose if we want to prioritize the right or left eye. By default, I use this on auto. Um, and then we have subject recognition frame display. I would definitely leave this on. I just like to have that visual feedback to know that the autofocus is following my subject by seeing a little frame around their face or eye. And then we have face memory and register face priority. This is really great if you're going to be shooting, you know, something like a wedding and, you know, you want to be able to prioritize like the bride or the groom's face. You can actually choose to register their faces in here. And then if there's a group, the camera will know to prioritize focusing on those registered faces. You could also choose to prioritize your face if you're vlogging and you're gonna be like in frame with a lot of your friends, but you wanna stay focused on you, you can go ahead and register your own face or whoever you want. Next, we have some focus assisting options. 
There's focus map, which you can turn on. This is going to give you some different colors and things that you can look at that help indicate the foreground and the background. Basically, whatever doesn't have an overlay is in focus. And then there's red and blue colors to help you know the foreground and the background depth. Then you have the focus magnifier, which I use all of the time because basically while you're recording, you can choose to punch into the frame just for your own visual reference to make sure that the camera is getting focus or if you're doing manual focus. Um, and I find it super helpful. I actually assign this to a custom button, which I'll talk about in just a little bit. Got focus magnification time and your initial fo focus magnification. So how much it's going to punch in initially. I like to leave these as they are. Then we've got peaking display. Basically what focus peaking is, is a color overlay to help communicate to you what your camera is currently focusing on. It doesn't actually apply it that way in the footage or anything. It's just there as an indicator to you to let you know what is in focus. If you turn it on, you'll start to see it and you can choose you know, how sensitive it is. I like to leave this on low. And then you have the ability to choose different colors. I usually use red, but say you're in a situation where you're shooting a lot of red stuff, maybe it's like super RGB red style lighting, you may wanna you know, change this to blue so that it contrasts more and you can really tell what's in focus. But again, by default, I like to leave this on red and I'll turn it off for now, but I'll actually add this to the a function menu later and I'll show you guys how to do that. Next up is the playback menu. There's not a lot to cover here. It's basically some settings for how things are viewed within the camera. You've got different view modes. Uh, you've got some different ways you can enlarge your files while you're viewing them in camera. Um, you could delete stuff, um, edit certain things. If you wanna rotate images or whatever in camera, you can do that. Um, you can play a slideshow if you wanna connect this thing to a TV, this is where you would do it. Um, and yeah, that's basically it for the playback menu. I don't really mess with this too much. It's pretty straightforward. Next up is network. This is where you're going to kind of see your options for when you're connecting to things, whether wirelessly or wired. Right off the bat, we have some smartphone connection options. This is where you can get into the Sony Creator app and get your camera connected. Um, there's PC remote functions, remote shooting settings, a lot of different things there. I'm going to skip FTP transfer, but here is a very important one. If you are somebody who's going to be live streaming, um, you can go into this streaming section, USB streaming, and this is where you'll be able to select the actual file of the USB live stream. So if you're connecting this camera to your computer via USB C, this is where you're going to choose the file size. The other stuff that you've selected does not matter. It's going to be overridden by whatever is here. So this is a very important setting if you're streaming this way. Um, I would definitely select 4K 30P. This is the best option out of the ones available. It's gonna give you the best looking result. I've tried it and it looks phenomenal. So I would definitely do 4K 30. Underneath this, you can choose to enable movie recording during streaming. So if you wanna be streaming, and recording to the SD card so you have different file sizes or for whatever purpose, you can choose to enable this here. Underneath this, we have some Wi-Fi settings. There's some Bluetooth settings. So if you wanna use something like a Bluetooth remote, you can do that here. Um, if you're plugging in wired, if you wanna do shoot tethered, you can get into all this stuff here. It's not something I do very much at all, so I'm not gonna be covering it too much, but this is where you would access it. And then you have some network options as well. And the final tab in our menu is this yellow setup where you'll be able to do a lot of customization things. This camera has a lot of custom buttons, a lot of dials, and it's within these settings that you'll be able to kind of customize it and custom tailor it for your workflow. First up, we have area and date. This is where you can set the date and time as well as the some area settings. Uh, next up, we have reset slash save settings. This is kind of nice because no matter what you're doing in your camera, you can choose to just go ahead and save it. And you know, that's a good option to have. It's really here on option number three, operation customize, that we get into a lot of the details. This is where you'll be able to choose a lot of different stuff. You can customize your custom buttons for photo or video mode individually, or you can choose to have them mimic each other. It's all up to you. If we go into the photo custom buttons, we'll be able to kind of start scrolling through and this little 
chart right here will be indicating which buttons we are currently working on. So say we wanna customize, you know, button two, we can select it and then we can just go find whatever item we want to, you know, have it be. Um, so say we want it to be white balance, we could set it there. And it's as simple as that. For now, I've already got mine set up uh, and I'll cover this in just a little bit. Again, we can do this with the video mode custom keys, which is really cool that you can have them separate from each other. Um, and then, you know, playback custom settings. Then we've got our function menu. I'll cover all of this in just a little bit. So this is a really important one. It's record with shutter. I like to turn this on just so I can get an extra custom button back. By default, this is your record button. But when record with shutter is on, you can press the shutter and it will start and stop recording. This frees up this little red button to be something else, which I find useful. Underneath this, we have dial customize. This is where you can customize what each of your dials does. So this will give you another chart again, which will show you which dial you're selected on. And you know, say we wanna select this back dial here. If I select it, I can go into the menu and here's all the different settings that I can choose from of what I want this dial to do, which is pretty cool. You can do this individually for photo and video, and you have some other dial settings depending on your memory recall modes, which I'll get to in a little bit. You can choose which rotation you want them to be, whether normal or reverse, whichever feels more comfortable to you. And you can choose to unlock or lock the wheel dial. Next up is touch operation. This is super cool because this is a touch screen, so you know, I can move around the menu using the touch screen, which is nice, but I can also use this when shooting, which can open up a lot of really cool things. So I like to leave touch operation on, uh, and within this, I like to do, you know, touch panel and then touch panel settings. There's a lot of different things that you can do here. And this is where you can, you know, access different things. Like by default, there's these little side icons and you can choose to swipe these away or bring them back. And if you don't want to do that, you can choose to, uh, you know, get rid of those things. So if you want to turn shooting screen off and now those little icons are not there, if you find them distracting, you can do that. Again, you can go back and turn them on. And there's a lot of different things you can do. You can choose if you want to swipe right or left, you know, swiping up to open the function menu, which is a handy little thing. But if you find that to be annoying or to be, you know, getting in your way, then you can just choose to you know, turn that off. And now when you swipe up, nothing happens. So you've got a lot of control over how you utilize this touch screen. I pretty much left all of this stuff as default. It's pretty good. So icon when monitor flipped, that's nice too. If you, if you kind of are accustomed to where your icons are and you flip your screen, you can choose to change this or not. There's a lot of options here. You can dial it into your liking. Underneath this, we have accessibility. So you can actually use a screen reader where the camera will actually read through menu options and things to you, which is pretty cool. You can also choose to enlarge the screen. Uh, and then there's a finder and monitor section. The main thing in this that I think is super important to note is monitor brightness. So if you're outside in a bright sunny day and it's really hard to see your screen, chances are you're on just the manual or default settings but you can actually choose sunny weather and the screen will get a lot brighter. I find this pretty useful. Um, it's a good one to know about. Again, you have some other, you know, monitor displays. If you want to flip, you know, when you flip your screen and all that stuff, you can choose how, how it handles that. I've left most of this stuff uh, as default, but again, you can choose to go in and customize it if you want. Uh, then we have some different display options. If you want to display the LUTs or whatever, you can do a lot of different stuff there. Then we have one of the most important settings to change in the whole camera, which is the power setting option, auto power off temp. You need to set this thing to high. When it's on standard, the camera will show an overheating icon and just stop recording and stuff a lot sooner. When it's on high, you basically don't even have to worry about it. I've never had any issues with any of my Sony cameras like actually getting damaged from overheating or anything like that. Basically, this is just allowing the camera to record a lot longer. All right, then we've got some sound options. If you wanna leave the sound on, you can get into the volume settings and choose how loud those things are. There's 
you know, the four channel monitoring, this is going to be more important depending on what sort of audio interface or mic you have connected to the multi-interface shoe. Then we've got some USB settings. A lot of these things you'll see pop up when you actually connect to the camera over USB. Um, and then we have external output. So if you are going to be you know, running this via, you know, the mini HDMI into like a capture card or something like that. This is where you'll be able to choose the resolution of what the camera is sending out over the mini HDMI. Um, I would go ahead and just set this to, you know, uh, 2160p. I think that'd be good. Be a little bit higher quality. Uh, the HDMI output settings, you can choose if you want to show time code, uh, things like that. And then we have the HDMI info display. So if you're going to be running this to, you know, something like a HDMI recorder, like a, a Ninja or something, um, I would probably say you should turn the HDMI info display off unless you're wanting to do something where you're showing your menu settings for a tutorial. In which case, I, I would probably be more likely to do that myself. So I'll leave it on. And then you've got control for HDMI. Then, of course, under setup, we have setup option clever again. So one of the cool settings here is going to be this anti-dust function. Um, and what you can do here is actually choose what your shutter is going to do when you power off the camera. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. I'm going to take my lens off for a moment. Now we'll go ahead and power off the camera and it, it will take just a little bit, but you'll see that the uh, electronic shutter curtain is going to close. This is pretty sweet because it will help, you know, protect the sensor from dust and things like that. Just a nice protective measure that you can choose to use. Um, but just be careful to not damage the shutter either uh, because that could be potentially expensive to replace. Sensor cleaning is going to be, you know, if you want to do a nice deep clean on your sensor. I actually have a tutorial on how to do this properly, uh, which I'll link right here. Uh, or down in the description below. So if that's you, you can watch that video. I go into more details on that there. Down here is where you'll be able to see what software version you're currently doing. Um, then there's a privacy notice. That's pretty much it. We've just walked through every single thing on the menu in video mode. Now I am going to switch this briefly to photo mode. And when I go back to menu, you'll notice there are a few different things. For example, our shooting menu red icon is now a camera. And as we you know, go through this, there are a couple of different options now. The main ones that I want to talk about is your file format. I would recommend either leaving this on RAW and JPEG or just changing it to RAW. Personally, I just like to shoot in RAW. Within RAW, you have a couple of settings. Uncompressed is going to be the largest, most detailed, highest quality RAW that you can get, which is probably what I would shoot in most of the time. But if you know you're gonna be shooting just a ton of photos for like a live event or something, you may wanna experiment with doing a compressed or even a lossless L or something. And just you'll just wanna experiment and figure out what is gonna work for your workflow. But for me, I just do raw uncompressed. Then you've got some more JPEG options, which if you're shooting in raw, won't matter. You'll see your file format and stuff for video, which we've already covered in the video settings. Uh, you've got long exposure noise reduction, which, you know, I would just leave on. Um, there's, again, some lens compensation stuff. And that's pretty much it. Uh, there's some drive mode options. Um, so, you know, if you want to shoot like rapid fire, you can change some of this stuff here. If you want to do a self timer, things like that, this is where you can get to all those things. You can choose if you want to do a mechanical or electronic shutter. Personally, I would leave it on mechanical. Uh, and that will just change, you know, if you go into like silent shooting mode, then it will use the electronic curtain, things like that. A lot of these settings are going to be the same uh, as they were in the video mode. Some of the main differences are going to be you now have like a flash option. So if you're shooting with flash, you'll have some custom controls here that you can go through and change. Those are the main differences between the photo and video menu options. Now that we've kind of talked through, you know, all of the menu items, I'd like to start talking through how I've set it up just to give you some inspiration. Now, I'm in no way saying that the way I set it up is the way to do it. Um, it's just the way that I've found that I like to do it. Um, and it changes a lot, you know, as I try out different things, I'm always trying to like get more efficient and all of that stuff. So we'll talk through a few of the ways that I've customized it that I'm enjoying so far, and maybe that can serve as a nice starting place for you.
For starters, let's go into our setup icon on page three for operation customize, and we'll go to our photo custom key dial set. This is where we're going to start customizing the custom buttons. I've got my C1 set to peaking display. I've got this AF button set to my APS-C mode because I love to switch on and off with that. I shoot with primes a lot, and this is just a nice, comfortable, fast way to switch between full frame and crop sensor mode. Down here, I've got picture profiles. A lot of times I shoot in standard, but occasionally I'll shoot in a log profile, and I like to be able to bounce back and forth and kind of determine what I think it needs for the particular scene. Uh, on the center button right here, I have focus standard. On the left button, I have the focus mode. So this is a quick way for me to be able to change you know, what my focus mode is. Then we've got ISO, which is labeled ISO. And then for the down button, I actually have my custom white balance. This is just a way I've had it set up with other cameras for a while. On the top, which is this little button right here, I've got focus magnifier. Again, we changed earlier so that the shutter button will actually start and stop video recording. But then this button over here is now going to be assignable. And I've assigned this to focus magnifier. This is really nice because it will help me kind of punch in and get better at focusing. Then depending on the lens that you have, like right now I have a Sony lens, I can actually assign this as a custom button. And I have this set to zoom. This is going to allow me to operate with that clear image zoom like I chose earlier, and is a just a really nice use of that button. Uh, then I've got some dial settings. So on the uh, very front dial right here, this is one of the newer dials that's been added to the A7C Mark II. I've changed this to my custom white balance. I'm experimenting with this right now. I'm seeing if I like it or not, but it's kind of nice to have this additional dial where I can kind of just easily, quickly, without having to go into any menus, start changing the custom color temperature of the white balance, dialing in that Kelvin number. The next dial on the list is this back dial, which I have set to aperture. Uh, and then I've got this top dial right here, which I have set to my exposure compensation. And then there's this control wheel which I have set to my shutter speed. Then we've got our video custom key dials, which I have most of this stuff set to follow photos, just so that it has a more congruent feel to the camera. But it is nice that you, know, you can choose to distinguish some of these if you want to. And now let's talk about the function menu settings. Let's start by talking about my video function menu. So first of all, I've got my audio record levels so I can easily you know, adjust my volume. Then I've got my steady shot settings, so I can choose to enable or disable that. Then these four options are all about autofocus. So I've got my focus mode, focus area. I have if I want to have subject recognition on, which is nice because sometimes I'm you know holding something up to camera or whatever, and I can just turn that off. And it's basically like the product showcase mode. And then I've got the recognition target. You know, most of the time I leave this on human, but it's Kind of fun to experiment with trying out different stuff right now. So I have that set there. Then I've got touch function and shooting. Sometimes I like to turn the touch functionality off uh, depending on what I'm doing. If I'm vlogging a lot or doing certain things, sometimes I'll like accidentally keep bumping the screen while I'm like rotating it around or whatever. Sometimes I'll just turn it off, you know, but most of the time I will leave it with touch tracking on. And it's nice to just have that easily accessible in the function menu. Then I've got peaking display where I'll just choose if I want to have that on or off. Uh, then I've got my breathing compensation. We talked about that earlier. And then I've got grid line display. So if I want to show my rule of thirds grid or not, I can easily do that. And then these last two options are the autofocus transition speed and shift sensitivity. This is really nice because if I'm shooting some nice shots of you know products, I can easily adjust how fast or slow my autofocus is going, and it's really easy to get to it in this function menu. To be honest, I haven't really dialed in my photo as much. It is pretty similar though. For starters, I've got my drive settings, then I've got you know steady shot again. These focus areas are all the same. This touch and peaking is the same. Instead of breathing compensation, I have white balance on here. Um, and then, you know, I've got my silent shooting mode and 
I don't know why I have JPEG image size. I just haven't gotten that far with settings in photo yet. But yeah, this is basically what I have in photo as of now. And one of the final things that I wanna to talk to you guys about that will really help in kind of dialing in your camera settings is memory recall. This is going to be reflected on the mode dial with these numbers one, two, and three. Essentially what it is is really fast ways to access different settings that you've sort of predetermined. For example, in video mode, if I switch to option one on the mode dial, I will be in 4K 24 FPS. But if I switch to, you know, dial number two, I'm gonna be in 4K 60 FPS. And then in dial number three, I'll be in HD at 120 FPS. This is so much faster than going into the menu, finding the file format, changing the resolution, changing the frame rate, then adjusting my shutter speed. You can change all of this stuff in advance. So that's how I like to do it. Again, mode dial number one, I've got 4K 24, shutter speed set to 50, I've got 1.8 on the aperture, my ISO is at 100. Sometimes I'll save these with ISO on auto, but most of the time for my shooting, it's a little bit more controlled. So I like to just have it switch to 100. And you know, as I switch it to setting number two, you'll see instantly I'm in 60p with the proper shutter speed and everything's good to go. And then if I switch to number three, uh, I've got HD 120, again with the proper shutter speed, and everything is good to go. So the way that you can change these things that I would recommend is just for starters, switching to manual mode and then going ahead and setting up, you know, say we wanna set our uh, 4K24. We'll go into our menu, we'll select the file format, change the movie settings to 24, 422. So we can set our shutter speed, you know, to the double the frame rate. We can adjust our aperture to be whatever we want it to be. We can adjust our ISO. Let's say we want to do maybe ISO auto this time. Uh, we can adjust the color temperature. Let's say we want to be on 5600. We can adjust all of these things. And then all we'll need to do is go to our menu. And because we've already added in the camera set memory, we can go ahead and select this and we can choose one, two, or three. So let's go ahead and choose one. Now, whenever we go into one on the mode dial, we'll be recalling those settings. So we've got 4K 24, 150, 1 1.8, and our ISO is auto. If I switch again you know, to two, we'll be on uh, 4K 60, double the shutter speed, and ISO is 100. But again, if I just switch back to one, it will be what we just created with our ISO auto. So it's really nice to be able to customize these things. And the really cool thing is that because of this photo video hybrid switch, you'll be able to access one, two, and three memory recall modes in photo, video, and SNQ modes. The thing that I really love about Sony cameras is they are super customizable, as you guys saw. You know, there's so many little intricacies that you can mess with and really just make the camera work for you rather than against you. You know, at the end of the day, it's a tool and uh, you wanna be able to use it well so that you can create the best content possible. And one of the tools that I love to use with this camera is this 20 millimeter 1.8 lens. It's one of my absolute favorite lenses of all time. So if you're interested in checking out this lens, I've actually already created a full video that you can check out right here. Thanks so much for watching, and as always, stay creative. Peace.